Good morning, EBC. How are we doing today? Let's clap to the Lord. Good to see you. You glad to be here? Amen. I want to welcome those of you who are online. We're so excited about you being here with us as well, joining us in your homes or wherever you're watching. Grab your Bibles. Let's go to Genesis chapter 37. We're going to go through a lot of scripture today as we look at the story of Joseph. Well, Robin Island is a little three square mile island, beautiful little island off the coast of Cape Town in South Africa. And it sits just above sea level. And it's a popular hangout for seals. They love to gather there, thousands of them and thousands. Consequently, so do great whites who like seal snacks, okay? And, uh, but it's, and it's this beautiful little place, but you need to know it's not this vacation destination. In fact, for hundreds of years, it has served as a prison for many prisoners in the South African nation there. And it's kind of like an Alcatraz of Africa. And for 18 years, it served as a home to its most famous prisoner. Many of you know who that was. It was Nelson Mandela, who was a political prisoner for several years. And, and you should know a little bit about him. A lot of you probably do through school. But he was a major figure in kind of bringing reform in South Africa, uh, specifically in the racist system of apartheid, where the 14% minority of whites kind of controlled everything. And those who were the 86% of anybody with dark skin had no voice, no vote, no civil liberties, civil rights, nothing whatsoever. In fact, they were treated as second-class citizens. And Mandela kind of led just this charge for change and for reform. And in this process, you should know that he was the perfect person to do this. Perfect because he he grew up in uh, in a home where uh, with a mother who loved Jesus, loved people. So she planted that seed in his life. He also was a descendant of African royalty, so he had kind of that background himself there. He was educated in some of the finest schools, eventually becoming an attorney, a lawyer, and he was under the tutelage and kind of mentorship of a tribal chief who taught him great negotiation and and uh, skills and and how to compromise and skills that he honed. But as a young attorney, as a black attorney in this nation where this essentially apartheid was a, was a, was a racist system that was legalized, okay? And, but what he would say as, a, as an attorney in those days, he said, I felt a thousand slights, a thousand indignities is the, in the way that he was treated. So he led a charge for change, but instead of revolution, what he experienced was he was arrested for treason. And he was placed in this, in this prison, and he spent 27 years there, grueling years, where he was shackled and where he was placed in this place for wanting to do the right thing, okay, and standing up for something that he believed in. And in that time, you have to know that he must have thought, just thoughts like this, how in the world could a season like this, where I tried to do the right thing, how in the world could this ever be a part of God's plan for my life? I mean, these are questions that we wrestle with whenever maybe we go through something that's a setback at our job. Or maybe you've experienced a setback because somebody that you love is sick and it feels kind of hopeless and and you're struggling with that and grappling with this. Or maybe it's been a financial setback or maybe there's been a relationship issue that you're battling with and you're struggling in your marriage or, or maybe you've kind of been locked in a prison of addiction. And you've wondered, how in the world did I end up in this place? And, you know, some parts of life seem to make sense, but it's these kinds of things that leave us with lots of questions. And they really cause us to to ask questions, and they are a challenge to our faith, and they stretch us, especially when we've been mistreated when we did the right thing. When we decided we were going to follow God and we still experienced maybe some hardship and something bad happened, they leave us with questions like, Can there really be any purpose in this, God? God, do you really love me? God, have you abandoned me? Am I alone in this? Why is this happening to me, God? And I I think there cannot be bigger or more fundamental questions than those questions where we wrestle with this. Well, if you know about his story, you know that Mandela was eventually freed and through a series of amazing events, he actually was in this place of rising from a prison cell to actually becoming the president of this nation. I mean, it's a meteoric rise. It's incredible what happened. And and I bet, though, while he was in the prison, I bet he never saw it coming, though, right? He probably never could see the things that were being orchestrated that would lead to this. I mean, that's a comeback story through a series of setbacks. 
One of the things that he said as he walked out of the prison, he said this, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew that if I didn't leave my, what's the word, bitterness, my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. And isn't that true about so many of us that many times, maybe we're not put in a literal prison cell, but a lot of us are locked in prisons of bitterness because of the things that have happened in our lives. Maybe we're bitter towards God. Maybe we're, we're bitter towards people who have hurt us. But you got to know this, that God specializes in comebacks when we've had series of setbacks. And in Genesis 37, I can't think of a better story to really illustrate this. And it's a story of Joseph. And this is not Joseph in the New Testament who became the husband of Mary, but it's Joseph in the Old Testament. And he is a pivotal character in the book of Genesis. In fact, he gets 14 entire chapters that are dedicated to the development of his story. Now, you should know that Joseph enters the scripture as an immature teenager who has a little bit of a problem by maybe saying some things unfiltered, things that were accurate, but he probably should have held his tongue. And he ends up saying some things to his older brothers that really gets him in a bit of a jam. And uh, he has some dreams where God is showing him that he's going to be a great ruler one day, and he shares this with his older brothers. Now, we get the benefit of seeing the process because we can read the story of what God was doing and orchestrating where God was going to eventually place him in this palace and eventually even saving millions of people's lives. And we can see that because we can read the story and we know the end of the story. But one of the hardest things, let's be real, about our lives is when we are going through a hardship, we can't see what God is doing. And that is so tough, right? That's what makes it hard on us. God's not worried about the things that are happening in our life, but we worry about them because we don't know how it's going to end up. And so we struggle with this and we wrestle with this. And, and I want you to write this down. This is really the premise of what I want you to get today. It's the big idea. And here is the thing. If you're going through something right now, you got to know that setbacks can actually become the greater stepping stones to fulfilling God's ultimate plan for your life. Some of the things that you would never think could be used, these setbacks, this is when we press into faith and we believe as, as believers. I can't see it, but I've got to know that God's doing something even though I can't see how he's working. And a setback can either become a greater barrier in your life where you start getting bitter, and let's face it, we all can wrestle with this, or it can become the stepping stone to realizing, you know what, God's launching me into, into something greater. God's going to use some of these things, even the things that, that were bad in my life. And Joseph is a perfect example. If you know his story, you know that he comes from the lineage of Abraham. God promised Abraham he was going to make him into a great, a great nation, this great nation where the Messiah would come. And, and so Abraham has a son named Isaac, and Isaac has a son named Jacob. And Jacob's name literally means supplanter or deceiver. And, and, and Jacob's a character, right? But God changes Jacob's name, and he gives him the name, anybody know? Israel. He gives him the name Israel, which means prince of God. Isn't that interesting? And he gives him this name, and he changes his identity, and, and, and this is the lineage that Jesus the Messiah comes out of. Now, they were chosen by God, but you got to hear this today. They were chosen by God, but they were far from perfect. Man, read that story because you're going to see that they were a, an incredibly messed up family. I mean, they had some serious problems. Jacob had 12 sons from four different women. And you need to understand that this was not God's plan for marriage. And, and I believe God allows us to see the dynamics of this. The Bible doesn't hide these facts. It shows us that, and, and we know this, there are complications, there are massive problems that emerge and complexities in the family relationship when there's some brokenness that happens like this, right? And they were what we would call a mega blended family. And we have a lot of blended families in our church, okay? And if you're a blended family, you know this, it, it can be tough navigating relationships, it can be tough navigating, you know, step parenting and, and, and uh, parent, you know, parenting kids that maybe aren't yours. And this was the case in Joseph's family. He's the second to the youngest, and he is smart, he's good looking, he's talented, and he is favored by his father, which causes all kinds of problems, especially this, he is hated by his brothers. I mean, I'm not talking about 
annoyance. They hate him. They hate his guts. And this is where all the setbacks begin. A series of them that as you just hear it and you read the story, it's like, you got to be kidding me. This, ha- this, it's like things kept getting worse for him. You ever felt that way? It's like you, you can't seem to get over the hump and it's just like one setback right after another and you keep going through it over and over again and I want to show you that there are some setbacks that he experienced and you may not identify with all of them but I bet you can identify with some of them and you can probably relate to some of the things that he experienced and this story is given to give us hope it's to renew our hope in the fact that even when we can't see that God is working that he's orchestrating your story that he's never been out of control of your story. So write these things down. Here's some setbacks, a series of them, and it just like progresses, progressively gets worse for him. Number one, you need to know, he grew up in a, a very dysfunctional and broken family. I mean, this family put the fun in dysfunction, okay? They are messed up. In chapter 37, verse 3, it says this, and this is a big root of this, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children. That's some model parenting right there for you, right? Because Joseph had been born to him in his old age and was also born to him by his favorite wife. And so his favoritism creeps in here. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. And and you probably have heard of this robe. There's been musicals that have happened about this, the coat of many colors, right? And and I I just envision this robe has been bedazzled, all right? It's probably got a little bling on it. And he's walking around with his robe and bright, his his daddy's boy coat. And it says this, verse 4, but his brothers, what does it say? His brothers hated him. They hated him. They couldn't even say a kind word to them, it says, because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't speak anything nice to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more. It's like, we don't just hate you, we double hate you, okay? And I mean, it's lots of hate. And I've envisioned, how did Joseph like share this dream with them? They come to the breakfast table. The brothers are older brothers. They're all eating their off-brand cereal. And all of a sudden, Joseph brings out the fruity pebbles, right, that his dad got him. He's probably walking up in his blingy robe, sitting down, and he's like, guys, I had this dream. It was weird. And you know what happened? You guys bowed down to me. And the older brothers are eating their off-brand cereal. And they're like, you want to talk about awkward? And then it goes from not only awkward from annoyance to irritation. It goes beyond this. It says they hated him. I mean, they detested him in their heart. And, and you know, Jesus says if we hate somebody, that it's as if we've murdered them. And you're going to see that this is what this begins to lead to. It's hate, right? And maybe, you know, you have experienced something like this in your family in one way or another. Let's be real. We're all in a broken family because we're all broken people. There's not a perfect family here. If you haven't experienced divorce, you know that, that, that that's by God's grace, right, in your life. And, and, and here is the thing. Many of us have experienced some things, and, and, and you've gone through some things that could lead to some bitterness because of your family. Maybe you were mistreated as you were growing up. Maybe you were abused. Maybe you were, were put down or pushed around. Maybe you were ignored. Maybe you had a parent that was an alcoholic and never paid you any attention, and they were aloof, and they were never involved in your life. And it's just been tough for you to ever move beyond that terrible setback that you experienced in your life. And a lot of people stay locked in bitterness. And they're never able to move into some of the things that God has for them because they're locked up. They're locked up in this place. And maybe you had complicated relationships with step-parents or step-siblings, and, and you're trying to still navigate that, right? And, and home life for many of us, for many people, it can, it can really be some of the biggest wounds that we carry with us for all of our lives. By the way, that's why we have groups like Making Peace With Your Past. That's why we have Regen. That's why we have a Hope Ministry. Folks, we need to understand, Jesus said that the church is to be a hospital for the broken, right? We don't judge anybody. We're a hospital for the broken because we all have brokenness. But a lot of times when we have brokenness in our families and there's dysfunction, Many of us can walk forward and feel like we're inferior to others and that God can never use us. Sometimes we feel like the dysfunction in our families disqualifies us from ever being used by God. And I want to show you that that's just not the case. 
this can be our greatest source of pain and can lock us in bitterness. Maybe God's desire for you, if this is you today and you relate to some of this, maybe God wants to use the biggest pain that you've had in your life to be your biggest ministry to others. Because we see that that happens all of the time. You're going to hear more about that in a moment. Joseph grew up in a messed up family, but secondly, I want you to see, he also experienced great rejection from those who should have loved him the most. He experienced some deep rejection. His brothers hated him, and they turned this hatred into a homicidal rage. He was sent by Jacob uh, out into the fields where they were at in another town, watching over their flocks. By the way, the younger brothers should have been doing this. So the brothers were upset, and they were hating him. He walks up, verse 18, it says, Joseph's brothers saw him coming. They recognized him in the distance because his coat was shiny, probably. And as he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. We'll show him. So this resentment goes beyond even verbal and even physical abuse. Now we're talking about premeditated murder of their own flesh and blood. I mean, this is some deep hatred here. This is messed up. Verse 21, but when Reuben, one of the older brothers, heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into an empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph. Even Reuben knew this is wrong. This is wrong what we're doing. To, to return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers, when they arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe that he was wearing. They grabbed him. They threw him into the cistern. And now the cistern was empty and there was no water in this. Guys, they weren't easy on him here. They didn't like lightly. That, they physically assaulted him at this point. They're ripping this off of him. They're beating him. Can you imagine the things they must have been saying to him? The hatred that was pouring out of their mouths, that was in their hearts. They're throwing him down into this empty well where he is now feeling not just physical pain, but you got to think about this, the emotional pain that he was feeling, this rejection. And rejection is one of the hardest things that we can experience in our lives when we're rejected by somebody who should love us. Somebody that should have protected us. Somebody that should have stood up for us, right? Or someone, and, and, and there's some of you that maybe you've experienced this kind of rejection in your life. You haven't been thrown in a pit, but maybe you've just been cast aside with no regard. Maybe you experienced that as a child, or maybe you experienced it in a marriage that went, uh, uh, you know, awry, and you were cast aside, no concern, someone turned their back on you, somebody walked out on you, you experienced this, and that rejection like this, it hurts, and it leaves big wounds, and if you've experienced that, I want you to know as your pastor, and I, I hurt for you, and my heart hurts, and pray for healing for you. Joseph was a teenager when this happened, which tells me this, that's hard enough for an adult to go through. But he was a child. He was a child, and this, this was a traumatizing thing. It's rough on him. But it gets even worse. He's not only rejected, write this down thirdly, he was betrayed. And he was betrayed for monetary gain for, gain, for greed here. Joseph is within earshot down in this well. He hears his brothers and the coldness of their hearts towards him. Look at verse 25. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, they're having a meal as they are they're about to murder their brother. This is how cold their hearts were. And it says this, they looked up, they saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmael-like traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. And so Ju uh, Judah said to his brothers, now listen to the greed, what do we gain by doing this? I mean, we're, we're not going to gain anything by killing him. We'd have to cover up the crime. Well, that is mighty wide of you, Judah, to think about, you know, your other brothers in this moment. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him. Let's just sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother. He's our brother, our own flesh and blood. That doesn't even make sense right there, does it? He's going to sell his brother. His brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were the Midianite traders, came by Joseph, right, his brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him for 20 pieces of silver. You should know that slaves were sold for 30 pieces. So now they're even 
adding insult to injury here. And the traders took him to Egypt. Now this is, this is slavery. This is human trafficking. His own family's doing this to him. He's being betrayed. And people get sold out for greed all of the time. Now maybe you didn't experience it like Joseph did, but maybe you've experienced it in the business world where somebody cheated you because of wanting to make a little bit more money or something, or you had a business partner that in their greed, they betrayed you, or you had a a spouse that because of money walked out of the relationship and it was about greed, or a boss has cheated you in some kind of way. You gotta know that this was a devastating blow to Joseph and his brothers. As as, Think about, they're turning him over to them. Can you imagine the, the look on his face? He's looking in their eyes and he's thinking, you're my brother's. How could you do this to me, right? And, and on that dusty road down to Egypt, all the thoughts that must have been plaguing his mind of what he experienced. But you gotta know this, this was a blow to Joseph, but, but I'm gonna show you this, God was working. Because what we're gonna see is that God was positioning Joseph and getting him ready. God was putting him in Egypt where he needed him to be for what was about to happen because there was a famine that was going to occur. But you gotta know that it just gets even worse for Joseph. Look at what we find next, write this down. He had his identity erased. Some of you have experienced this where you've kind of lost something and your identity was tied to it. And his father, everyone else back home, they thought he was dead. His brothers lied about him. They basically erased their brother's identity. Joseph no longer existed because of the story that they manufactured. Verse 31, then the brothers killed a young goat. They dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? They won't even call him their brother. Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. What a traumatic thing for a parent to think about. And then Jacob tore his clothes. He dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. And his family all tried to comfort him in their hypocrisy. They're trying to comfort their father, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave mourning for my son. And maybe the hardship that you're going through is that you've kind of lost your identity whenever the divorce happened. And you just feel lost right now, trying to figure out who you are. When you lost your job, and a lot of people lost their job last year. And if your identity was tied to your job, it's hard to figure out who you are and where you're going. And maybe that's been a wound that you've experienced and a setback that you're going through in your life. But I want you to hear this. This setback doesn't have to be the end of your story because that's not what defines you. And that's not what your identity is. And in fact, God wants to give you an identity that transcends what you do or who you're with. God gives us an identity that is found in his son. Joseph, listen to the identity change, went from favored son to now he's a slave. This is a shock to his identity and it's been erased. And, but he's going to go because God's going to take him to another place. He's going to go from a prisoner, as we're going to see, he's going to become a prince. And it's not the end of Joseph's story. It's not the end of your story. Here's another thing that I see. We see that he's in a job that he never wanted or expected. Remember, he had dreams. He was going to be a ruler. He was going to be in a certain kind of position. And and, and he, he was a dreamer. But now he's a slave. And he's doing these menial tasks. Things he never thought that he would ever be doing. He was a favored son. And now he probably in some ways feels like he's wasting time in his life and wasting his life away. It says in verse 36, meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt when they sold Joseph to Potiphar, who was an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. So this is very strategic in the story because once again, even in the midst of this job that he's in, God is getting him ready for what is next. Maybe right now you find yourself in the middle of a job that you don't like. And there's some things that you just detest about your job or maybe some of the people that you work with that you don't like it and you're doing some things that maybe you never thought that you would ever be doing and you wish you were in something different somewhere else 
and you, and you just find this discontentment is what kind of you live with as you wake up every day hating your job. But I want you to, I want you to learn something in this because what we find in Joseph is that the reason God's hand continued to be upon him was because he lived a life surrendered to God to be used by God wherever and whatever he was doing. Wherever I am, God. And so we see that God ends up promoting him. We see that he gets noticed. He realized that God was his real boss. Maybe that'll be something that you'll take away from this today. If you've got a bad boss and it's somebody that you struggle with, that you don't work for him ultimately, you work for God. And so you want to do the very best that you can because you're serving God. And he gets noticed in his integrity. But you got to know, he does get noticed But he gets noticed also by some people that he didn't need to get noticed by. His boss's wife noticed him. And we see this. She's going to make some advances towards him. She's a person in power. And she's going to use that as leverage over him. And you're going to see that he gets punished for doing the right thing. Because there's some sexual temptation that's going to come his way. And it's going to persistently pursue him in everything that he does. And, and, And you're going to see that he's going to make the right choice. And yet he still gets punished. Have you ever been there? You did the right thing, and yet you're suffering today because you did the right thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing whenever we make a bad decision and then we have some consequences, we kind of are like, yeah, I can live with that. But when you do the right thing and you still have consequences, that's a tough pill to swallow. So he finds himself being sexually harassed and pressured into some sinful activity. In Genesis 39, he says this. So Potiphar, it says, so Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. And with Joseph there... Man, Potiphar was like, this guy is awesome. He didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. That's a pretty good problem for a boss, right? Joseph was very handsome and well, a well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come on, she says, sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, listen to the integrity. My master trusts me with everything in his entire household. Now, a person who's bitter, it would have been really easy to justify entering into sin right there. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I'll just go ahead and sin because obviously God doesn't really care about me. God's not watching. God's not with me. But he goes on. He says, no one here has more authority than I do. He's held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Listen to this. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against, say it with me, who? Against God. And so he's, he's obviously, he's, he's moving through some things and with integrity. And, and, this, and this woman was most likely very beautiful because Potiphar was a man of power and had a selection of women that he could pick. And she's pursuing, and it goes on in verse 10. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her. And he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, demanding, come on, sleep with me. And Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. And when she saw that she was holding his cloak and he had fled and she's angry, she feels rejected, she called out to her servants. Soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband's brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. She's rallying the troops. He came into my room to rape me, but I scream. She's lying about him. She frames him. She lies to her husband. Look, verse 19, Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and he threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held and there he remained. And I read this story and I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you know what I keep hearing over and over again in Joseph's life? What have we been talking about? You're on this path, you're growing or whatever, and what always hits? Crisis of belief. One right after another. Boom. Crisis of belief. What are you going to believe about God in the hard places? Are you going to follow God even in the hard places, right? And here's what's interesting. None of these things were his fault. These were things that just kept happening to him, right? And it seems like it's arbitrary, but you got to know that God in his sovereignty is putting a, God has a plan and he's working something and he's positioning him into places that he cannot see. Now here's something else that happens to him. You would think that it's going to get all better, but he is next taken for granted and he is ultimately forgotten. 
And maybe you've experienced this before. He gains favor when he's imprisoned by the jailer because, again, he, he becomes the top prisoner there because he has integrity. And God's hand is upon him. The jailer notices him. And he meets a couple of men in Pharaoh's court who are very uh, influential with Pharaoh, but they had made a mistake. And Pharaoh uh, throws them into prison, and, uh, and one of them ends up actually getting executed. But, but, but Joseph helps them out in a big way. And the one, the cupbearer who is released, all Joseph says to him is this, just remember me. Help me get out of here. I shouldn't be in here. And he says in chapter 40, please remember me. Do me a favor when things go well for you. Help me out, brother. Mention me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this place. For I was kidnapped from my homeland and the land of the Hebrews, and now I'm here in prison. But look at this, but I did nothing to deserve it. I didn't deserve this. I, I shouldn't be here. But guess what happens? Does he get remembered? Pharaoh's cupbearer, however, what does it say? Forgot. Joseph's forgotten. His help is taken for granted. And he never gives him another thought. And some of you have experienced this. Maybe, you know, you, you, you've gone through something where you've been taken for granted. Maybe someone forgot the, the kindness you did. And, and this has just been a setback. And you've maybe begun to feel a little bit of bitterness. Now, any person who keeps going through series of setbacks over and over and over again. Now, our natural response, I think for many of us, would be to say, you know what, God I'm done. Amen? Come on, am I being real here? Forget this, God. I keep trying to do the right thing, and nothing ever works out my way. And you can even get bitter with God. And maybe that's who, who you are today. Maybe you're bitter at some people that have hurt you, and you've been locked in this place for some time of bitterness. And and, and you may wonder, does this kind of stuff happen to people today? Are these the kinds of things that happen to folks? And I want you to hear the story today of a woman named Lisa, who is a part of our church family, and we're so grateful that she is. When Lisa told me her story, she's a part of our Hope Ministry, and she uses some of the things that have happened in her life to minister to others now. When Lisa told me her story, I could not help but think of the story of Joseph. Watch this story. I don't know, it started two or three years old. Um, I have been sexually abused by my father and my stepmother. The very people that were supposed to be helping me were the ones hurting me the most. And at the age of 14, my stepmother had become jealous of me. I remember riding the bus to school and getting to school and it was just a, a normal day. I had no idea what was about to occur in my life. I, around one o'clock, uh, I get called to the office and my stepmother is standing there across the counter and she checks me out and they took me down to the courthouse, checked me out of school, took me to the courthouse and signed a paper to allow me to get married to a man I did not even know. And she's given me instructions on after school that I was to meet, you know, what the, what the vehicle looked like and that they were gonna pick me up. And I was terrified and felt like a piece of trash thrown out. 3.30 came and the vehicle that she had described pulled up. I got in the vehicle. He drove me to the courthouse and his son and I got married standing in the courthouse. The next five years, I spent uh, beaten, raped on a continuous basis as well. Tortured is an understatement. A couple of years into this marriage, um, I find out I'm pregnant. The very first thoughts in my mind were, I've got to protect this child. You know, how am I going to protect this child? And, you know, two years later, another son. It was on a Sunday, December 3rd. I'll never forget it. He's telling me he's taking my children um, to his mom. And he had told me that we were going to go cut a Christmas tree. I remember it was drizzling and, and we're walking around and it seemed like we walked forever. He cranks the chainsaw and he's just standing there holding it, um, letting it idle in his hand. And I remember 
thinking something's not right. He turns around in full force swing with it. As I fell to the ground, he's holding it to my ribs. He then draws back and hits me a second time. And he is attempting to literally what I think cut me in half. And I, I am at this moment praying to a God I don't know to save my life. The next thing I know, um, he had gotten the gas can out of the back of the truck and I was swallowing gasoline. Um, he's pouring it all over me. He pulls out a box of matches and he starts lighting matches or trying to light matches. And somehow he made it through that box of matches without being able to light me on fire. Um, he grabs me by the back of the hair and he drags me to the truck and he puts me in the truck. And as he's driving me up to the house, he's telling me, you know I can come home at any time, so don't even try to go anywhere. As he's getting ready to leave, um, it makes it very clear that he will come back and he can come back at any time. Um, I'm listening to the gravel crunch um, as he's going down this long driveway. And I grabbed a chair and I started hitting the window to break it, doing anything I could. And I was able to break the window and I knew at that point that if I didn't hurry up and get out of there and he come back, we were all dead. I grabbed my one and three year old child and climbed through the window and I started running in the, in the woods, but I ran up to the back of this house and started panicking, banging on the door. And uh, when the person opened the door and looked at me and he yelled to his wife to call the police. So the police came and, and they got me. So as time goes on, um, obviously these things come out in different ways, the hurt, the pain. Um, I started seeking this God and I read in the Bible that, you know, if we want to be forgiven, then we must forgive. And I was like, well, God, I want to be forgiven. So I forgive them. And, and I thought it was that easy, but I was fooling myself. The road to forgiveness is, it's a long one, <laughs> but it's more, it's more than just forgiving um, the people. You have to release them to God. You have to release their consequences. You, you have to make the effort and choose to say, it's no longer my concern whether they do or don't ask for forgiveness. What my concern should be that they find Jesus. What my concern should be, that they find healing from the wounds that cause them to be the people that they are. When God is telling us this, to forgive, he's not telling us to help other people in the aspect of their own forgiveness, but to help us surrender and to release all that's holding us back so that he can begin the healing process and, and, and mend those broken parts so that we can be a disciple, that we can be a leader, that we can be an example to show people what that peace looks like, to live that. What an incredible story, and we are planning on doing an extended version of her story, and Lisa's actually here worshiping with us today, and we just want to say we love you, and what courage to share a story like that, and I want you to know some of her story is she is a CFO of a, of a company now that is well known, and God has put her in a place of influence, and she's that's part of her story now. Yeah, we can clap to God about that. She also... Uh, has not been locked in a place of bitterness, that it would be really easy to just live life bitter. You know, but instead, she has taken the greatest pains that are in her life, and she uses it for ministry in the hope ministry and, and helping women who have gone through uh, abuse and, and suffering like this. And I'm just so grateful and feel honored and privileged to get to be just a, a pastor in her life. And so I love seeing what God does is how he brings comebacks out of our setbacks. Now, what made Joseph resilient? What made him resilient? Let me give this to you kind of in finality here. I want you to see that no matter what life throws at you, okay, and life is tough. It can be so hard. How did Joseph 
to stay stable in some of these places. Well, I want you to write this down, and you're going to see it's very similar to what Paul experienced. He pressed into the presence of God. All right, and it's, it, there was an understanding that God was with him, and there's a phrase that's used five times in in all 14 of these chapters. In every new circumstance, Joseph would find him. He would find himself in whether it was the pit or sold as a slave or Potiphar's house or even in the palace or when he was in prison. Here's the phrase. Are you ready? And God was with him. Do you think that the Lord may be trying to drive a point home? When he puts it in there over and over again, he wants us to get it. God was with him. God was with him. In Acts chapter 7, it says this, Stephen uh, says this, these patriarchs were jealous of their brother Joseph, and they sold him to be a slave in Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all of his troubles. God even gave him favor before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God also gave Joseph unusual wisdom so that Pharaoh appointed him governor over all of Egypt and put him in charge of the palace, and eventually he would be a savior, so to speak for Egypt and all of Israel. But I want you to see this. Not only uh, did Joseph sense God was with him, other people saw God was with Joseph. Check this out. Genesis 39. The Lord was with Joseph. So he succeeded in everything that he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar, who wasn't a believer, right, noticed this and realized that the Lord, Jehovah, was with Joseph, giving him success in everything that he did. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, and look, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household. And I want to ask you this, do other people see God's presence in you, even when things are bad? Are other people blessed because they see the presence of God and see the hand of God upon you, or are you locked in bitterness? Because when we're bitter, we miss out on the things that God wants to do in our lives. Even Pharaoh notices this. Pharaoh thought of himself as a god, but Pharaoh says this. Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Can we even find anybody like this? Do other people see God's presence in your life? Are they blessed by this? And some of you, you may feel lonely today. You need to hear something. He's here with you. Some of you may feel disappointed, he's here with you. Some of you may feel depressed, he's close to you. The key is to press into his presence. Now here's the thing, even when you don't see him or feel it or experience it, and this is where we say, God, the enemy's telling me I'm all by myself, but you've got to say, no, I am not. I believe your promise, God. You are with me. And if you're a child of the God, the same God who's with Joseph is with you. Finally, what we see is we see that he also, what kept him stable, he trusted God's plan in his pain. He gets promoted. He's in this place of power now. And his brothers, who he had a dream, would bow before him. They're bowing before him. And you know what? This would have been a great place to retaliate. And he could have completely, in his bitterness, retaliated. But he saw that God had a bigger plan. And it's a key verse in Joseph's story. He says this. Joseph replied to them, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? In other words, I'm going to take you off of my hook and I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to put you under God's hook. You got to deal with God, but I'm done and I'm not going to be bitter towards you anymore. Look, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. There was a bigger plan. He brought me to this position. He brought me to this position. Look, so I could save the lives of many people and you you know, one of the things, again, that we struggle with is we can't see that God is at work. We oftentimes struggle and we can't see that he's doing something, right? And that there's, he's positioning us and he's shaping us and he's, he's forming us. And many times, rather than pressing into that and trusting him in this, we get bitter and we miss what God wants to do. And if you are, if you are in Jesus Christ, I want you to hear this as we close this right now. God is in control of your story, nobody else. God orders your steps. God knows the end of your story if you belong to him. And because of that, whatever it is that you're going through right now, you know what? It is hard, but you can be at peace because you know that God has your story. Amen?